Los Angeles is known for its graffiti, but it's also known for its soaring cost of housing and transportation, homelessness and addiction. Even those that work two jobs sometimes can't make ends meet, and they depend on things like food banks to provide for their children and their families. Haler is a graffiti writer born and raised in Los Angeles, and we made patches of his two-letter throwy, and the proceeds are going to be going to the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank, which is an organization that's been providing meals to the hungry since 1973, serving over 900,000 people in the L.A. area each month, primarily those of low income, children, and the homeless. 97% of their revenue goes directly into providing food for these people that are shit out of luck or children born into conditions outside of their control. 100% of our Patreon profits for the month of September will be going to the LA Regional Food Bank and for Haler for helping us make this happen. All who donate via our Patreon will receive the Haler patch as well as access to our members-only episode library. We got interviews from XSM, Les, Sean Crawford, Law29, and more. The link to our Patreon is in the description of this episode, our Instagram, and our website. For those of you who don't know what we're about and what we've been up to, in the last three months, we've donated 100% of our Patreon proceeds to Charlie, Hurt One, and most recently, Bat. We donated 5K to Bat to help him pay his legal fees that he otherwise would not have been able to do. And it's really nothing short of a blessing to be able to use this platform as a means for helping people in need who otherwise wouldn't get the help. We don't take it lightly. None of it will be possible with all those who signed up and donated over the past few months. And we just got to say immense thank you sincerely and peace to all of you. Enjoy the episode. Chino in the house, bro. Um, I want to say thank you for coming on the show. I've been waiting for this for like since I feel like when we started the show, you were one of the people who was on our list to be on. And I've been in contact with you for a while. And uh, I have this quote that you wrote. So you wrote um, about the era that you grew up in, about the time frame that you grew up in, which is very different from the New York that we're living in today, like we were just speaking on. Uh, When I was 17 years old, I was picked up outside of the Coney Island yard after a long night of painting trains with my friends. We were grabbed just outside of the yard by detectives Tom Weiner and Jerry DeSaro, better known as Tom and Jerry, of New York's Transit Police's famed Vandal Squad unit. Uh, Since the early 80s, there's been a long line of anti-graffiti detective duos that were notorious for capturing graffiti writers in NYC. Hickey and Ski, Curly and Ferrari, and Tom and Jerry. Uh, This is another one. I spent sizable portions of my youth writing my name on stuff that didn't belong to me, mostly subways, walls, and roll-down gates here in New York City. Light years before there was a thought of any real work-related opportunities, the only reward was the respect and admiration of my peers and occasionally seeing my name come off somewhere on the news. In the paper, a music video or film. So the way, the way I see it is there, there's a lot of uh, prolific graffiti writers. There's a lot of uh, people who are famous in the world of graffiti. But then there's like a select few that, uh, t- to me, stand out as uh, just there's fame and then there's another level. There's like real legends who have been around for a very long time and have really paved the way. And you, you fall into that group and... Like I was saying, you grew up in a time period where gang culture was was in Brooklyn was live. You talk about uh, Dirty Ones, Assassinators, Crazy Bush, Bishops, FMD, Filthy Mad Dogs, and how your neighborhood prepares you for the aggressive street nature of graffiti. So I guess my question to start it all off is what was life in that era like, your neighborhood, and in comparison to the world we're living in today? I mean, it's hard to explain. The world was drastically different, just on the most simple level, like... Political correctness was not a conversation until the early 90s. So, you know, you could call, not that you should, but people would maybe, you know, call their waitress toots or sweetheart or babe, right? And that's someone's wife, that's someone's mother, that's someone's daughter, (laughs) that's someone's girlfriend. The dude that's probably flirting with her probably has a wife at home. But there wasn't a conversation about political correctness. If you look at the cartoons that I was weaned on growing up, there was a shitload of racism in all of those cartoons. And there just wasn't a conversation about political correctness till the 90s. But I'm a child of the 70s. Like, Mm. I was born in 68, and most of my childhood was the 70s. And, you know, New York wasn't uh, its prettiest or its strongest or its best New York growing up. Um, Quality of life offenses were prevalent. Um, There were just all sorts of behaviors that existed in the 70s that are no longer acceptable behaviors. And I get it. I think that we were growing as a nation or a culture, and 
it typically takes a couple of generations to get acclimated and maybe do better. You know, if you look at this model that immigrants have had, like, it typically takes a generation or two to become westernized or acclimated or have that kid actually go to college and graduate and education becomes a greater uh, priority. But a vast, so the time frame, most of the kids I went to school with had family in the South. And I think that it, it's on the direct heels of civil rights and people migrating to a more like liberal North. And those families, kids were kids I went to school with. So every summer, everyone in my school was going down South for the summer and they had Southern drawls. And I asked my mom like, why don't we don't go down South in the summer? And she's like, we're not from the South. Mm. But um, it was just a different, you know, I think it was an era of like white flight where, um, you know, on the heels of Robert Moses building highways that led out of the city. Um, and, you know, New York was allowed to hit rock bottom during that window. And, you know, so I would imagine from like the early 70s up until just past the crack epidemic, New York was probably at its ugliest, and it was almost impossible to get arrested for a quality of life offense. You could get caught racking and talk your way out of it, or they would just be like, yo, put that back and get the fuck out of here. Mm. You know, so things were so much more relaxed. There was no surveillance places. Um, and then sticking people up, like just, you know, there were stick up kids everywhere. And I think what made the city, especially Brooklyn, so dangerous with it, it was filled with opportunists. And, it was sort of baked into the culture of where I lived. And, you know, like you might, your mom might send you to the store to get some milk and you see some kid with a sheepskin coat or a ski hat or something you want, or there's kids at the bus stop and you shake them down for their bus passes, like on route to the store. Mm. You had no intentions on doing anything bad, but somewhere in your route to where you were going, you saw an opportunity that you needed to, um, you know, flex on or, or move on. And that was common and that was sort of the New York we lived in. And, you know, going back to this political correctness thing, like when I was 13 years old, like grown men would beef with me. And, you know, like I'm in a playground and some dude with a beard is like trying to level up with me or call me out. And, you know, I'm like, this dude just got out of a car. Like he's got a beard. Like I'm in the park playing with my friends. Grown men would tap my pockets, size me up for my sneakers. And, you know, it doesn't, ha not that, People don't do that, but that's some real dirtbag shit to do mm -hmm. in 2021. If a grown man is like, you know, when that grown guy snatches an iPad from a little kid, it's on the news now. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that was sort of a norm, like predator prey and people were just preying on people. Um, and sort of everyone I knew was poor. You know, an, an expensive pair of sneakers was like 32 bucks. You know what I mean? And, and it was hard keeping those things. But... It, it felt like maybe maybe the circles I was in, but New York was uh, probably allowed to hit rock bottom and it was probably its ugliest, you know, throughout the 70s and it just got a little bit uglier in the 80s. And then slowly but slowly, I think Giuliani was maybe the first mayor we had in New York that started aggressively prosecuting people for these really petty infractions. Mm -hmm. And I think it resonated with folks. If I'm going to get stopped for peeing in the street or if I'm going to stop for playing loud music or drinking in the street, I probably shouldn't have a gun on me. Mm. And I think that, you know, I, I wasn't a fan of the G Gestapo tactics. They were knocking down doors. Graffiti writers were getting their houses raided during his er administration. But it seemingly was a effective. And he kind of made an enormous dent in the crime wave here in New York. But, you know, there wasn't the serious charge for carrying guns. You know, like... In the 80s, at some point, it became a mandatory one-year sentence. But if you had a clean record, you could probably get off with probation. Or maybe they'd sentence you to a year, and with good time, you're home in four or six months. But there was no real charge for guns when I was a kid. So people carried guns it's free. It's a to totally different world. It, it completely. I mean, crack re really sort of revolutionized everything. Like the proliferation of large caliber weapons started to happen during the crack era. You know, like when I was in junior high school, like guys had 22s and 25s and little guns. And by the time, you know, maybe 10 years later, like dudes are carrying machine guns and, you know, have access to rocket launchers and all sorts of scary shit. Yeah, like they, they talk about how um, how every few years, every cell in your body is replaced. So in a few years, you're literally no longer the same person. And think about that in terms of New York City. It's like every few years or a, a big portion of the people, the infrastructure, and the laws change to the point where the, the Brooklyn, the New York City 
that you grew up in, that you saw graffiti and that you uh, saw these stick up kids, a lot of that for a major part is, is no longer existing. And I think about that time era as a time where, um, granted, I didn't take part in it, but it's like nothing is really 100% good or 100% bad. And that era, from what I see, it spawned so much uh, art and culture. It spawned uh, the, the particularly like, the graffiti writers that legitimately started a movement around the entire planet. And that's, uh, and part of me is like, you, you talk about opportunism and, uh, that kind of stems from some sort of need. And, uh, like the graffiti writers at that point, like they brought so much flavor. They bought, they invented their own culture with their own rules and their own, their own, uh, tactics, their own, uh, traditions, things like, things like racking, th things like, uh, the fact that you have to do this many on this train lines inside and out and all, all that stuff. It's like pretty, pretty much like it was a, wor it was a world of, uh, you know, violence and stuff. Also a world of a lot of, uh, art and culture from not just graffiti, but also from music to just general art and, and, and all that stuff. Uh, how do you think that that time period and, and the violence and the, and the laws and the criminalities that were happening influenced your mind? Cause it was essentially during a period of your life where, it's like the foundational period of your life, which is so sure. important to framing <clears throat> everything else. You know what I mean? No, the formative years were crazy. And, and it was, you know, not by the choice, but sort of, you know, it was the world I lived in and not by design, but it was the world I lived in. And dysfunction was rampant. At times it was celebrated and it was just everywhere. And, you know, it's really easy to normalize dysfunction. Like if you if that's the world, you know, you don't have anything else to compare what you're daily day-to-day -day experiences mm. are like there's nothing that I could have looked at when I was you know 18 it took me to be in my 20s until I moved out but I think that you know similarly jazz and you know blues and all of these things are birthed from like hardship and hard times mm. and and there's something you know real about that um hard times birthing something that's like as beautiful as art and graffiti or hip-hop or whatever that might be and for so many of us like it's a crowded city it's easy to fall through the cracks here and graffiti kind of, you know, um, gave you an opportunity to stand out. Like, you know, graffiti writers are super possessive. Like, this is my line. This is my wall. This is my train. This is my yard. And that's coming from a community of people that didn't have very much. So what you have, it's almost like prison in a weird way, right? Like in jail, like if everyone's wearing slippers and you've got a pair of Jordans on, you're the man. And, you know, but having something when no one else has something is just enormously important this weird little metric of like i got a ring on or a watch on like you don't need a watch in prison but i guess it makes you look cooler amongst mm -hmm. other people if you can hold that down or you've got something flashy but we were a community of people that just didn't have much in the dysfunction i mean i grew up in projects and there was no clear distinction like the building i grew up in looked like the hallways looked like jail like the yard that we hung out in kind of looked like a courtyard in prison and all of the coolest dudes on my block were dudes that just came home with an extra 25 pounds of prison swole or muscle. And you know, that's a lot of, there are a lot of layers there to unpeel as an adult and stuff. You know, it took me moving outside of New York to realize just how um, fucked up it was the way I grew up. Mm. And then meeting people, I dated someone that wasn't from New York. And when I saw the school she went to, and I was like, Jesus, this is like a college campus. Your elementary school, your junior high school, your high school and your colleges all look like this. And you know, my school's allocated to this one little block. It's all concrete. There are no trees or anything. So it was a drastically different experience, but it wasn't until I moved outside of New York where I started to like talk to people that weren't a part of this criminal element or weren't shady. Like I could leave my door unlocked, although I never did. Um, chances are if someone was running up behind me, they were jogging and it really <laughs> like it, I had nothing to compare life to other than what I knew from New York. So it's very easy to normalize. You know, there are people that grew up whose parents were like pimps, right? And that's just normal in their household, that his mom was a hooker, his dad was a pimp, and that he had a stable of women. Like, I, I don't know if I can point to anything that's as dysfunctional or disturbing in my head, right? But for folks that grew up that way, that's just normal. And there was really nothing that told me what we were doing wasn't normal, mm -hmm. um, you know, and sadly, I mean, I think most of the guys I looked up to until a certain point in my life were super dysfunctional and the craziest dude on the block was a dude that, you know, you wanted to be friends with. And 
I can tell you as an adult, man, that crazy dude is the last dude you want in your home in 2021. Yeah. You know what I mean? And But as a kid, I didn't really have anything I could point to that told me that this wasn't healthy. And, and there's there's no there's no Instagram, there's no YouTube, there's no, like, you can't just see the life of people from all over the world in a split second. So it's not easy to compare. You just see your homie next door and uh, the people at your school, and this is just the world, the entire world, maybe, to you. But what I can say is the beauty of graffiti is that it got me off my block. Mm. And, you know, I could still visit my mom. She still lives in the same neighborhood. And I could see a lot of the dudes I grew up with still on the block. And there's dudes on my block that are still hustling. 99%, maybe 90% of the dudes that I hung out with growing up all sold crack once that became a thing. And thankfully I had graffiti and it got me off the block. And because I wanted to paint trains in Astoria, I had to ride the R train, or which was a double R, to the last stop at Ditmars to go paint trains in Astoria. Um, I had boys uptown, so we'd go to paint trains at 155th Street Layup beneath the polo ground. So I'm in Harlem. I'm in Washington Heights painting at 175th Street Layup. I'm in East New York. I'm in Sunset Park. I'm in Lower Manhattan and Midtown riding on trains. So my graffiti experience got me off the block. I met people from all different cultures and races and religion and ethnicities. And it really did give me a better rounded New York experience. You know, um, I was coming out of a party one day and I saw these dudes from my block and they saw us on the West Side Highway and they were honking the horn. And for the next five years, all they talked about was, yo, remember that time we saw you in Manhattan? Like as if I bumped into them in Cairo or we were like on the French Riviera or something like mm. that. And it was, it was a huge <laughs> yeah, yeah. deal yeah. because they don't leave the block. And they would ask me all the time, shit, like, yo, wait, when you leave the block, where do you go? There are still people all over the place in New York that are like that. I, I get it. I read a story once where this dude had never left his Bushwick neighborhood. He was a grown man. His entire world revolved around living in Bushwick. He had never been on a train into Manhattan or Queens. And I could kind of see that happen. So I'm, I'm absolutely grateful. Graffiti got me off the block. Mm -hmm. I think I was literally like a hair away from potentially being that dude that was still on the block somehow. You, but, when you were younger, did you ever feel like, yo, I want to be a part? Like you say, the cool dudes in your neighborhood was the, the dudes who come in, you know, 20, 25 pounds of swole from prison. You never wanted to join, like, uh, FMD, Crazy Bishops, any of those gangs? Oh, yeah. I, you I, admired I, them? or Seventh, eighth grade, we were trying to dress like them. And, you know, the truth is that I'm fortunate that in spite of my mom being overwhelmed, being a single mom and holding down an enormous Latino family and taking care of me and my two brothers – that there was a lot of love in the house and that we did have guidance. The bad decisions I decided to make outside of the house were solely on me, mm. right? But I was fortunate that I had a base at home and a lot of these folks didn't. And that's what kind of made my experience a little bit different from theirs. We yeah. were all poor, but some of these dudes I know went home and there was no one in the house when they got there. They were fending for themselves. They had to steal food to feed themselves and, you know. And it's all of these crazy things where by today's standards, like, you know, um, some sort of state agency, there'd be some sort of intervention, hopefully, in 2021 if there was a kid at home without a parent that wasn't eating. Mm -hmm. But this was sort of normal. Like, I went to school with kids that were physically abused with, like, welts on them from extension cords, and they weren't showering, and they smelled bad. And I don't think that these types of things can slip through the cracks today. Whether or not they're effective at addressing these problems in 2021, I think at very least there are agencies and there are systems and like, you know, I think your teacher will probably make the assessment like this kid looks bad and they'll have a conversation with the guidance counselor and maybe call in a parent and see if they can help somehow. But there was no intervention, like just things were super dysfunctional. But yeah, I wanted to be like gang, uh, the gang dudes on my block that were a little bit older than me kind of hung out. One day I was on route to school and these dudes were just posted up in the subway with bandanas on and as I turned the corner, they were just like ready to... And it's two dudes I grew up with. They were my friend's older brothers. And they were like, I was like, what are you guys doing? They're like, yeah, we're out here for Vicks. And they were trying to rob people. And foolishly, I just kind of hung out with them for a little while shooting the shit. I didn't think that whatever they might have done could have landed me in prison. And then the truth is that they were at my local train station. They could have stuck up my mom. Mm. And then the longer I got to know them, they robbed people in the building that they grew up with. And they did all sorts of crazy shit. And graffiti is the kind of thing that once, you know, um, once that spark was lit, it just really, you know, I've said this before, but when you discover that thing in life that you're passionate about, 
it sort of just changes the trajectory of your life, right? Like it dictates who you decide to spend your time with and what you spend your free time doing and everything starts to change. And once I found, you know, discovered graffiti, it, you know, it, it really sort of uh, got me off of that gang. But I did a lot of bad things, you know, in, in writing illegal graffiti and stealing spray paint. You make allowances for yourself, you know, like, you know, my ability to normalize going into a store and maybe stealing 50 cans of paint, right? Like, that's not okay. As an adult, I understand mm -hmm. that. I'm not going to criticize anyone that still does it, but as at that stage in my life, you know, just like... It's literally, it's literally normalized. Like I'm like no one sees it as evil, borderline not even a crime at that point. And and I'm pissed off that we got caught stealing, or the guy looked at me funny on the way out. Yeah, he had every right to. I'm up to no good. Mm. But you know, um, yeah, stealing spray paint. And then you know, um, quote from Style Wars, which I've cited on a bunch of times, is that graffiti is a vocation, and its youthful traditions are handed down from one young generation to the next. So older dudes would tap in my pocket when they walked by to see if they could feel a wallet or any change. They're putting their sneaker next to mine to see if my f shoe might fit them. And you're getting sized up and tested constantly, and then that's passed down to you. Mm. And then when you're old enough to do it, you start tapping pockets. And it's a vocation, and, you know, all of my favorite writers were assholes when I was growing up, and they were mean, and the entire generation of graffiti writers before me were involved in some sort of hostile cross-out war when I was just getting my feet wet in the culture, and I was like, what the fuck am I getting myself into? And you know, it's like, they passed the baton to me, but the baton they passed to me was on fire. Like, it was burning. Dudes mm. were beefing with each other and, you know, getting beat down, and you know, graffiti's that one element of hip hop where, you know, I don't know if DJs fight the same way, MCs or B-boys, but writers are just get it popping the second they bumped into each other. You know, mm -hmm. you're on a crowded train, you bump into someone you got beef with, it's, and it's on site on a crowded, a train, you know, in Midtown somewhere. Mm. 100 people in that car and two idiots fighting in the middle of the day. <laughs> and, you know, so it was also a magnet for dysfunction, you know, like the whole idea of just sneaking into a tunnel and writing your name. And, uh, but I'll say this, and I've said it before, graffiti, the indigenous people are like the most resourceful people on the planet. We made the best of like the city that we grew up in. And, at 14 years old, I knew more about subways than probably people that worked in the MTA. And at 14 years old, a 15-year-old taught me this. And he learned it a year before he taught it to me. And there was a mentorship, and you kind of handed these jewels down from one young generation to the next. It, no, it, it truly is crazy, the, resource, the resourcefulness that's, that's present uh, in graffiti writers that could be looked at as uh, idiots. Um, there's a lot of people who really can adapt to situations very quickly in very savvy ways, and it's pretty impressive if you look at it from a, a non-normalization point of view, because you're not, like, say you didn't know that. Like, if I was explaining to this to someone else, like someone in my family, they'd be like, what, are you serious? Like, this is what they're capable of. This is what they do. This is, uh, they found out all this stuff. They got the keys to this place, and then they, what are you, What? That's not possible. Like you're gonna get caught. You get caught right away. Things like that don't just you just you don't just get away with stuff like that. But um, I think through graffiti, um, you are able if you're able to tap into like you're able to realize like the amount of possibility that is there in everything if you are willing to just adapt and and do whatever you have to do. Like there are writers that will literally get on pretty much any roof without question. They will be like, yeah, I'll get on there. Like. If they don't even know the, they'll just find a way or or just from filling fire extinguishers with graffiti paint oh these stickers don't work get ones that are made from this crazy substance that peels off right away or that you know how to mix inks you know how to make sure if it's inside it stains but if it's outside then it has to be opaque for the sun or blah 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 like you have to know it's pretty it's honestly impressive it's not it's i feel like it goes uh, unnoticed at least for me like i get used to it i'm like it's not it doesn't impress me anymore but if you think about it, it really is impressive. No, um, I do talks occasionally. Like, I'll find myself in a panel discussion discussing graffiti. And, like, so here's a snapshot of maybe what it was like to be 15 for me, which was I steal a school eraser from school so that I could make a marker. You know, I find the plastic bottle. I can fill it with ink and then stick the eraser in there. So I can squeeze and get drips as much as I want. 
and uh, it's a broad nib. I don't have to refill as frequently. And then most importantly, when I get done writing, I could just discard the entire thing. I don't have to bring a marker home with me. If I get stopped with ink on me on the route home, I don't have anything with me, right? But being able to make your marker. Some people made their own ink. I was fortunate enough that I grew up near the Barclays Center, and we could re-circle uh, back to this if you're interested, but there was a place called Samuel Lundeberg, and it was an industrial uh, supply store, and they sold price stamping ink. So if you looked at the Charmin or, you know, like Palm Olive or whatever it is in your stores, there was a price marking gun that put the price on it, the little price tag on it. I think most things are now, like, built in with barcode, and they can just scan it. But mm. there was a price tag at the bottom, and... But that violet ink that went in the price gun, it was sold three or four blocks from where I lived, where the Barclays Center is now. And because it was my hood, we would just wait outside and shake kids down for ink. Like, mm. you knew that on a Thursday and on a Friday, kids wanted to ride on trains over the weekend. And sometime between noon and whatever, kids would be... So, you know, it was my neighborhood. And we just... When we got to an age where we got familiar with, like, okay... Either we're going to get shook down or we have to shake people down. But I got f the ink was free. The marker was free. Dudes were making train keys. Like you could get a skeleton key at a locksmith and just bend it slightly. And it would be like a BMT and IND key. And if you left it straight, you can open the IRTs with it. Right? Um, at 15, I knew the train schedule. So I knew that if I wanted to destroy a layup, I'd have to wait till Friday night. And at midnight, they'd start laying up the trains from closest to Queens Plaza towards Astoria. So if we hit that first station, I don't know if it was 36 BB or whatever it was, we could follow the layup as it was being laid up. And I had a window from midnight to 5 a.m. to hit it, and then the sun starts coming up in the summer, around 5, 15. But by that time, we're, we're at Hoyt Avenue. I could spend an entire night just writing on shit, and it was absolutely free. I hopped on the subway to get there, right? Um, I could get in the car and the lights could be off and maybe I don't have a key, but I can kick the corner of the conductor's booth and pop it open. And then in the dark, there's a lump there and the first switch is the fan, the second switch is the light. So if I want the AC on, I can turn the AC on, I can turn the light on. Where there's a blue light in the tunnel, there's typically a cutoff switch, you can turn off the electricity. There's a phone there and there's a fire extinguisher and there's an escape hatch. So the phone is brilliant. You could pick up the phone and ask for an outside line and be like, you know, we would hit 155th Street layup. My boy is Suey, Dole, HP173, all lived in the polo grounds. I could be hitting the layup and be like, damn, I'm rolling low on ink, and I'm thirsty, and I'm hungry. I could hit somebody from that phone in the tunnel and be like, yo, we're down here painting, bring some extra ink, grab me a bottle of water, and bring me a sandwich. I'll reimburse you. And then my boys will come. I just used a transit phone to invite people into the layup that I'm painting in. The cops come, I can grab that fire extinguisher and create a cloud of dust and we can escape through the escape hatch, right? Um, you lift the seat, there's a lever and it opens the door closest to the lever. And they're just all these small things on ding-dongs. You could lift the door, push in and pull up, and if you don't have a key, you can open doors that way typically. But I had no business knowing any of this shit at 15 years old. That's crazy. And, and the working knowledge I had of the subway system in my willingness to crawl underneath a train if I had to, or run on the top of one, you know, like, I think about it now, like, I'd scale, we'd shimmy up elevated platform poles to get in a layup and shimmy back down so we didn't have to walk back to past the token booth clerk. Like, yeah, like, like if, if, if uh, a Vandal Squad officer, or worse, if it's not a Vandal Squad officer, it's just a random worker comes to try to catch you, I don't think that person understands who they're trying to catch. Like, there, it's not just an like a 15 year old idiot who wandered in here. He knows every single thing and has plans and will do a lot of things. Like, go onto the train, go on top of the train, cloud of smoke with a fire extinguisher, move this lever. You're up into the sidewalk. Like, the person is. It's not just like a regular person that he's coming to catch. He has no idea. Like, my my um environment works in my favor where they used to use these things they call them work pump paddles they were these wedged paddles that they would stick in conductor booth doors and there's literally in the old carriages or the old subway trains where the seat is there's a bracket where that paddle goes you can pull that thing out and you've got a weapon in your hand the tracks are full of rocks like one of the dudes i used to bomb with used to pitch he could pick up rocks and peg you from a mile away in the tunnel right and then the evolution of like getting comfortable in a tunnel. The first time I saw a worker, I went running out of layup. Second time I ran out of layup. Third time I ran out of layup. And then it got to a point where one day I was like, these guys ain't cops. Mm. I'm like, what's good, man? You guys gonna rat on us if we paint here? 
and they're fucking in the carriage getting drunk in the Coney Island yard. And they're like, do me a favor, man. I don't give a fuck what you do. Don't tear down any posters. And if you have to take any, take them with you. But don't make a mess. That's all. Don't write on the glass. Don't tear down posters. And then it got to a point where, like, I'm probably hosting some pandemic weight today, but I'm lighter than I was typically as an adult than I was at 18 years old. I mm. mean, I weighed 250-something, and I was just massive. I was eating meat and, like, huge. So I'd see conductors, and, you know, I was like, I'm bigger than this dude. What the fuck is he going to do? <laughs> like, I'm with eight dudes right yeah, now yeah, that are yeah. ready to throw hands if shit gets hectic. Yeah. And I'm just like, what's good, man? We, we respect you. We know you got a job to do. I'm just here to write my name and this and that, or we're doing whatever. And they'd just be like, whatever, man, go the fuck ahead. And it was just like, oh, wow. Like, you know, it's almost like um, you see, like, scenes of Africa and shit, and there's, like, a deer a couple of feet away from a lion, and you're mm. like, what the fuck is going on? How's he just chilling there? But it was one of those things, like, we used to run from these dudes, and then it just got to a point where I was like, look how big this, like, look how small this, and he's out of weight or he's out of shape. And, mm. and, and obviously, I guess, like, every 18, 19, 20-year-old, you think you're invincible at mm. that point, right? Like, there's all sorts of things going on in my head. But I just remember getting to a point where, like, I just wasn't afraid anymore as long as it wasn't Vandal Squad, right? It, it, then, I, then I was cool. But if it was a track worker or a conductor, man, I was just like, oh, man, what the fuck? This dude doesn't want to chase me. He has a job to do. And catching me isn't a part of his job description. But again, I mean, this is sometime between 83 and 88, right? Like... How how serious you hear? I hear so many stories about the Vandal Squad of that era, uh, about famous famous officers who are in the Vandal Squad of that era, about uh, what they would do and how well versed they are. You you, you said in a, in a video that um, they were just as they were just as knowledgeable on a lot of the graffiti writers. Same people who were on the top of their list would have been on the top of your list. Like how just how serious were they? How because you just said like as long as it wasn't Vandal Squad. Um, yeah, like, how serious were they? Um, we got, uh, we got caught coming out of the Coney Island yard. Technically, we didn't get grabbed. It's part of that story. Like, we hit trains, and because I got caught in East New York, they recognized me on the street, and we were two blocks from the yard. So they pulled up, we got grabbed. They held me for a warrant that wasn't good, and all my friends got cut loose later that night. So, um, I had the pleasure of being able to spend some extra hours with these dudes when my friends were cut home but the entire time we were there they were trying to broker deals with us and I was like seriously how much trouble could I get in I just, I fucking marker on me and whatever or I, I don't even know if I had a marker on me at the time I had a train key on me and I had a knife on me when they grabbed me mm. that's what it was and they were just like yo you work with us and they had very specific names they were looking for and I would always try and downplay just how much graffiti I did. And they were like, what do you write? And I was like, Dave. And I'd write my name on a piece of paper. And by the third time I was in Vandal Squad presence, they were just like, dude, man, either you're the most unlucky toy or you're lying to us. We don't see you up. But the first time we talked, they were looking for, like, active graffiti guys. You know, um, I guess it's safe to say this because it's so many years later. But they were looking for the RTW dudes. They were looking for WoW crew dudes that lived in Marlboro Projects. They were close to the yards. The same rumors that we were hearing about these dudes coming into yards and robbing people at gunpoint, they were hearing. And that was an enormous concern for them. I didn't have anything. I didn't know anything about them. So there was nothing I could possibly tell them at the time. I was like, I, don't, I can't work with you, homie. Like, I don't have anything for you. But when they start bragging about who they caught, and when we caught this guy, he started crying, and this guy's a little bitch. And then there were dudes that they had tremendous respect for, and it was almost crazy hearing cops, like, give graffiti writers props and shit. That motherfucker's crazy. We chased him off 18th Avenue, and he shimmied down a pole like a monkey, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting here listening to these grown men. And, uh, but they were so knowledgeable about the culture. And then the small things, like if you're writing with a drippy marker, there's a good chance that there's ink on your sneakers. Mm. There's going to be ink on your clothes somewhere. That drippy aesthetic was like the, the drop falls somewhere, and it, if you're dripping properly, it's on you somewhere. But they knew to look at your sneakers, your hands, your clothes, and shit. They'd size you up that way. Um, you know, they'd have binoculars and shit. And the fact that they could post up three blocks away and watch you and shit. You know what I mean? And like, oh, fuck. It was just not something. You know, you're, you're sitting around looking. And you're like, there isn't a car in sight. I can go in here now through this hole in the gate. And dudes are literally posted up four blocks away. And they can see you perfectly. Or the fact that there's even 
infrared like they, they took it super seriously then night vision to the point shit. where they had binoculars oh yeah i mean the fact that they use night vision goggles when those things were i mean it i think like any technology when it's new it's literally thousands and thousands of dollars mm. or, or it's super expensive until it becomes more common technology and the price point eventually comes down but they had infrared or night vision goggles like back in the day and i was just like dude man they can spot you like a mile away just through your thermal like body heat that you're giving off and shit which is scary so um but you know the average cop didn't want to run in tracks yeah and, yeah you know and Vandal then squad it, would run in tracks they would and what's funny is um like they knew things like kingston kingston and utica layup kingston at some point in the 80s just became like a, a scene where if you weren't in the layup writing there were kids on the platform waiting to meet the writers coming out of the layups and then they're making things hot by writing on the platform and signing black books and kind of powwowing on the platform like 10 deep. But the cops knew on any, then the cops said it. He said on any given day, we'd go to the Kingston platform and just catch toys hanging out or coming in and out of layup. And they knew about 121st. They knew about so much shit. And there were so many people that every time I bumped into Vandal Squad, they'd just be like, yeah, what about this guy? You know that guy? And I was like, don't know any of these guys, sorry. But, um, did you, did you ever actually face serious consequences for doing graffiti? You know, the, the real upside, and I think about this all the time, because um, I think Style Wars has got things fucked up for people, right? Like, you see Mayor Koch in there, and he's pretty grumpy about graffiti. And he's kind of pissed, and he's talking all about crazy tactics of putting wolves in the train yards and how to punish graffiti writers. And when he died, I saw, like, so many people, like, fuck that, especially Europeans. I think that they... I think Style Wars registers with them very differently, mm. right? But they were like, so many people were like, fuck Koch. And I just thought to myself, no, like, God bless Koch. Had he not been so lax on graffiti, I'd have a real criminal record right now. Mm. And all of my heroes would have felonies. Everyone I looked up to would be a felon. Most of the people I look up to probably would not be able to, what, what do you lose your rights to vote? You can't get a Pell Grant. You can't have certain licenses. Um, traveling travel is probably the worst thing if you've got family abroad and there's a funeral in a family and you can't get into canada australia or london because you're a risk somehow because you're a criminal so it would have fucked a lot of people's futures up and i think that in a very strange way we owe a lot to Koch for being so relaxed but i in theory probably could have got court writing on trains a hundred times and not gotten in any real serious trouble well in i probably had gotten caught riding on trains once in my life and i've been in the, i've been in the custody of vandal squad on three occasions and uh and the truth is i could get stopped for like an open container or like doing something else i could even just stuck on the side of a road and need real assistance and have the most demeaning experience with a cop who i was hoping might help me hmm. And Vandal Squad was just professional. Like, you weren't getting roughed up. No one I know ever got beat up by a Vandal Squad officer. No one I know ever told me that they got fucked up. It was a beat cop or someone else that beat them up. But Vandal Squad was professional with the work they did. And I'm absolutely grateful that during the generation that I grew up, it was so relaxed. I think had I been active during an era of Giuliani, they could have easily attained the warrant and knocked down my door and just seized whatever they wanted to to make my life hell for the next five years. Mm. And I know a ton of people who've had garbage bags full of things seized from their homes during the Giuliani era. And maybe it didn't, maybe it didn't end up um, weighing heavily against them in a court of law, but by seizing your hard drives, your computers, your videotapes, your CDs, discs, audio tapes, and files and photos, they kind of clipped your wings and kept you fucked up for a couple of minutes. Yeah. And now the people that look up to you are a little bit nervous about being in your spot, right? And it might not have proven anything, but it's a tremendous inconvenience for you to just be caught up with litigation until this shit is over with or see your name in a newspaper suddenly with your address printed there. No, it's horrible. Right? So I'm, I'm super grateful that, like, it really was a walk in the park when I was, you know, growing up. So I think I've gotten caught by Vandal Squad on three occasions. And by the time we were street bombing... You know, I rode on trains until 1988, and systematically the MTA began eradicating subway graffiti almost line by line. And then by the time it was just the J train that was still bombed and the B train, 
and guys were painting the bees in Tishman layup right above Central Park on the east side and guys were painting the J line last stop at 121st Street the elevated station I lost interest in it like I it felt like they were shooting fish in a barrel there was a lot of quality graffiti that came out during that era but then it was also Lord of the Flies and there were just a ton of new toys trying to get their feet wet that probably were too afraid to bomb when the competition was thicker but either way, I just started to lose interest in it. I learned to drive maybe a summer before that, and we would go racking, and I wasn't ready to quit, so we would street bomb. Like, and it was sort of like we were that first generation of, um, or that first wave of strategic street bombers. It was probably always street graffiti, but when you had trains that could carry your name through four boroughs or three boroughs, that was probably the prize for many years. And then we started street bombing, and crack was just so bad, it was impossible to get arrested for street bombing. No one took you in for that shit. So do you think it was easier back then to go all city than now? 100. Well, so there, logistically, right, there were different challenges. There were a million neighborhoods, or not a million, but there were several neighborhoods that you couldn't walk into comfortably because of the crack epidemic. Like, being on the east side of Manhattan, like, in the triple digits. Like, there's dust up there, there's crack up there. There's heroin up there. There are drug dealers up there. Like, dudes don't want you making the block hot if they have customers coming in and out all night long. And if you're writing graffiti over there and drawing attention to the spot unnecessarily, someone might fire a shot at you, mm. right? Like, been in, in Long Island City near Queensbridge doing streets when dudes start shooting, in bed style while shit starts happening, on Myrtle Avenue while things pop off. And I don't see that with the same frequency. Hmm. today i'm not suggesting it doesn't happen it's actually getting to a space where it's seemingly more common now but back then so i think in terms of legal like um getting in trouble and getting caught it was a little bit easier but i think it was also far more challenging just based on how dangerous it was so what, what about the buff back then streets or trains uh streets that was non, not heard of. Like, um, it's weird. Like, when I started doing streets circa 87, 88, there were tags I had in certain pockets that got a 30-year, 28-year run, 20-something year run. Wow. And I think about it now, and I'm like, you know, like there were a handful of guys that went hard in the last two years. None of that shit is there anymore. And the risk versus re reward is very different. I don't know if I'd have the determination or even the interest to go that hard on something that wasn't going to last but there are seriously like, like every now and again someone will be like dude this you and it's a faded chino tag on like a brick facade somewhere still running and i'm like dude that's from 88 like i don't even know how that's still there but some of that early street graffiti we did had such a sizable run so i think that yeah th there was really no street buff like there wasn't an agency involved in cleaning street graffiti. Now you can go across all of these major throughways, 34th Street, 42nd Street, 14th Street, you know, 8th Street, Manhattan Canal, Houston, whatever. There's graffiti, but they'll come through and clean gates and everything is gray the next time I'm through and walls get buffed. I mean, now I think they've got some challenges. I think New York got hit harder um, since the pandemic started than ever before. I think this is arguably the largest, the greatest proliferation of illegal street graffiti that New York has ever seen. Mm. You know, like this is, and I'm from a generation of like, we were the first guys kind of strategically targeting main streets and off ramps and, you know, and it was a real strategic thing. Guys like Easy, Jaws, Josh Five, my man TK, my man Shammer, my partner Trim. There were a ton of guys out there bombing, but we were, like, easily that first wave of strategic graffiti. And, you know, TK had tags in Flatbush forever. And, you know, Jaws had tags running places forever. And um, there was no buff. I think that most of it either, you know, ended up uh, being eradicated by development. Maybe the building collapsed. Someone else took over the business. Or it eventually just faded but there wasn't really any emphasis on cleaning streets back then. Yeah, uh, in terms of, like, the fact that they did get rid of all the trains, uh, the graffiti on the trains, and then it did come to the streets, and you talk about how they did it systematically. They took out line by line um, to the point where it just wasn't worth it anymore to paint, to paint trains because the risk versus reward was just so lopsided. 
Do you think, because this is a thought that I've had before, I've talked about it on the show a number of times, do you think that it would be possible for them to do the same thing in the streets in New York? Because uh, most people will say no, um, but I, I think they also say no because we're living in the time we're living in. I'm sure there are some people who, who you probably would have asked that about the trains in their heyday, and they would have been like, never, never. But it happened. Sure. Um, of course, the trains, it's easier, probably. Uh, but at the same time, it's like there are certain neighborhoods in New York where you just don't really see graph um, within within Manhattan. Even there's very little graph because they clean it right away. So sure. riders know no point of going because it'll literally be gone the next morning. Sure. And I, I think even some certain gates and walls in, in a bombed neighborhood don't get hit because they know that gate and wall will get buffed immediately. So it really barely gets hit. Almost never. Um, like whoever hits it d- didn't know. And then and then. Yeah. So. Do you think that's possible or no? I don't think so. I mean, they might be able to control it in pockets of New York, mm. but literally wherever there's a hood, it's going to probably receive less attention than the Upper East Side or some of the more affluent communities in New York. You know, like Brownsville is probably not as pampered as Brooklyn Heights, right? Like there's probably zero graffiti within the confines of Brooklyn Heights just because property values are up, there's a greater police presence, and I think their community boards, uh, there, there might not even be a community board in some of the hoods that we're talking about, right? Like, things are just that bad where, and then, you know, you have to pick and choose your battles. If people are firing guns, the spray paint might not be your top priority, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, it's so easy to, that it, it makes graffiti a minor infraction compared to some of the life-threatening, like, mm things going on on your community or maybe it's the gang presence or something like that that's probably a greater risk for your kid than the graffiti but you you know sort of like the squeaky wheel gets the oil i think in certain situations and and so you know wherever there's going to be an underserved community i think there's going to always be an abundance of wall space sadly and uh you know i think it would be impossible to control it you know um i don't know but i think that new york did an amazing job of like putting a fresh coat of paint on the city during the pandemic and when things started to shut down. Yeah. Um, in terms of graffiti in your life, you, you've been doing it for a long time. But when you first started, aside from just uh, getting your name up and stuff like that, what was your actual purpose? What do you feel like it did for you a, as a as a as a younger person in terms of like? I want to say like your soul or something like a like a release or what did it do? What what was the greater purpose it had in your life? And how have you been able to sustain that passion as the years have gone by and you've probably changed so much since when you started? Yeah. I think that like most folks, I thrive on competition and being told that I can't do something. And, you know, they they really stack it as hard as possible. Like, you go into a layup and some grown man with a beard is pulling a knife on you and you're like, what am I signing up for, man? I'm fucking 14 years old. Like, I've got school the next day, you know? And um, it was super dangerous, but the whole idea of, like, these challenges, right? There were these small road bumps, like bumps in the road on route to where I wanted to go and, and just perpetually trying to figure out how to beat that system or beat that challenge mm. or get over, right? And then... There's a certain rush, I think, that that teen angst, like I was an angry kid, like I was just an angry human being. And, um, you know, I think that comes a lot with being young sometimes. And all of that youthful angst, this was like the perfect outlet for what I was doing. And it sounds weird because I'm a grown fucking man and I've done so much since graffiti and I've never pulled this card, but I wrote on a lot of shit in the 80s. And there was a small window, maybe the summer of 85, where, like, we were in the Coney Island yard literally every night for, like, two, three weeks before school started because we were like, yo, let's just saturate the trains. And on a weekend, I could go to Astoria layup on a Friday night. We'd get there at midnight. We'd fucking bomb till 5.15, 5.30. There was a small routine. We'd get off at Hoyt, um, walk up to Dittmar's, steal some bread and a newspaper and chocolate milk from Frank and Andrew's Deli, jump in a story a pool, rinse off the ink, go swimming, get back on the train, and we were usually riding the train that we bombed back to Brooklyn. Go home, sleep a couple of hours, go to 45th Street, go to 50, 45th Street on the NRR, 53rd on the NRR, maybe catch four sets between those tunnels, and then if we were up for it, 
go to um, Bay Parkway or Sheepshead Bay, and then go home, regroup, and hit the Coney Island yard again. And, like, that wasn't, like, that's not an exaggeration where I might have been in one train yard and three layups between Friday and Sunday. And that's what my primary emphasis was. And I see corporate people do it all the time. There's like rage rooms and like sort of smash therapy and things like that where you're just destroying things and Mm -hmm. alleviating all of the stress and pressure. And I think in a very strange way, like bombing trains was sort of my version of that, Mm -hmm. that it was, you know, beyond therapeutic and it was almost impossible to describe and it was just something satisfying about taking a drippy tag in the whole art of it all, strategically placing things high up, large enough, so that even if you're not on my side of the carriage, you can see my shit from across the train and trying to, you know, and it just working in print and branding and, you know, just how things are positioned in advertising. Maybe it was just an early exercise and some of that for, from what's to come, but it was impossible to explain just how therapeutic maybe writing on 13 trains at 175th on a Friday night might be, right? Coming home exhausted and waking up and being inspired to go do it again. Like being a gym rat, coming home, getting your ass kicked Mm -hmm. and being beat up and looking forward to running back to the gym the next day, Mm -hmm. right? So it was sort of that same outlet or relief for me. And I don't know if I would have gotten through my teens. Like, I, you know, like I had so much pent up aggression and anger growing up, you know, and like everything in life, you know, you start to address these things, hopefully, and you, you can get closure on some of the things that are bothering you and start figuring things out. And then obviously with maturity, the landscape of things starts to make a lot more sense. So things that might have peeved me are just like, kind of look back like I can't even believe this shit was an issue at some point. But for that stage in my life, it was sort of a release. It was a relief. And then, um, you know, graffiti is a lot like skateboarding, right? Like, when I was growing up, everybody had a skateboard. And when I was growing up, everyone had a tag. And then, you know, if you look at skateboarding, maybe a select, you know, like, um, if you look at skateboarding, lots of people do it, but then only a handful of people might stick with it. A sm- or are known for that. Or, or, or a small handful of people will stick with it. A smaller handful of people will get really good at it. And a very select few will be widely recognized for their skill with what they do on a skateboard. Mm-hmm. And it's the same with graffiti, right? So it was just a stack, like, it was a pastime that everyone did growing up in New York. All of the dudes on my block had a tag when I was growing up, right? So then it comes a point where all of these dudes that tried to shit on you are just like, crushing it you know and that's sort of some of the reward and then you know it's like someone gets shot somewhere and the news is set up and they're right in front of your tag and you're like oh shit all right gotta keep this going (laughs) and shit and that was really the small takeaway yeah you know like if you're a dancer i guess you could cut up the dance floor and have people applaud or you're a dj you can see people dance the mc can really see immediately the fruit of his labor by you know killing it right while he's performing but for the graffiti writer they were just so few takeaways but then you know um the whole idea where it came a point where like guys that i grew up looking up to started going over me and like your gut reaction is fuck this dude but at the same time like i'm on this dude's radar like i'm clearly a threat Mm -hmm. i've got to be a problem if these dudes that i grew up looking up to are beefing with me and they're the same dudes that beefed with everyone i looked up to before I started writing. So it's sort of like you feel like you've arrived in a very strange way, right? Like when all of these guys, and then some of the guys you looked up to want to go painting with you now, right? So it was just inspiring. And uh, in a very strange way, there isn't much that I got into as a kid that has sustained my interest the same way graffiti has. Do do, do you ever, what do you think about fist fighting for graffiti? And do you ever regret any any of the fights you got into or any of the beefs that you got into? Um, you know, it's a tough one. Like, I try my hardest not to get to a space where I'm that dude as an adult. It's just not a good look. But um, it was par for the course when I was growing up. And a lot of dudes stepped to me because I was tall, young. So, you know, I might be six foot one at 14, but I'm still 14 years old. Mm. And the dude that stepped to me just got out of a car 
and his man's got a beard, <laughs> right? And the other dude's carrying a beer. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck? And, but, um, so true story, like when we were like, I was like 11, 12 years old, some dude on my block stole my jacket. He was like, hey, let me see that for a minute. He put it on, he took off. So me and my best friend were obsessed with wrestling growing up. He was a ranked martial artist. This is when you say wrestling, you mean like uh, like WWF, WWF oh, like WWF. Okay. just you know that type of thing. Okay. Like we thought it was real. I was convinced I'd be a pro wrestler one day. I mean, this is like ten year old me thinking that I'm gonna. But I could do a sunset flip, and I would jump off of gates and headbutt people and elbow people and drop kick somebody on the street. So we got good at that. My best friend um, at the time was a ranked martial artist, but. When I say ranked, like, they were kung fu and karate magazines out. And when they showed the regional rankings, he was always, like, ranked, you know, something in peewee competition. And what, I did, what did he do? Um, he took karate and a host of other, like, martial arts. And I didn't have the discipline for it, but because we were best friends, like, if he had to fight somewhere, I'd help him stretch. I'd hold focus mitts for him. And every now and again, I'd hit the mitts. So I think I developed a reasonable hand-eye coordination from doing that and he was such a great fighter that they were very simple fight techniques that I figured out from sparring with him growing up that were enormously helpful in my adult life you know like he could kick the shit out of me he could you know throw his leg at 12 o'clock and drop an axe kick on my shoulder and I'm out the game for six months and I had to figure out how to stuff his kicks yeah. I had to figure out how to cut the ring off so that he couldn't run in circles and make me dizzy and, you know, so there were really, like, basic fight principles that I sort of figured out. And with him as a dynamic striker, I couldn't give him space to operate. I had to cut the ring off mm -hmm. and not give him room. And then he'd use his leg to threaten me, and I realized how to neutralize his leg. But from just fucking around with him most of my childhood, it was amazing how many things that we practiced as a kid that were sort of just baked into my thinking where when something happened, my hands moved at the same time with it. Mm -hmm. So I've had reasonable reflexes most of my life. And I got my jacket taken at 11, 12 years old by like 17, 18 year old dude. My man that I used to practice martial, well, that did martial arts and my man Sammy, we saw him and we started chasing him and he started running. And, you know, it's like, if, had he stood his ground, I don't know if we would have even stepped to him. Hmm. But the, se the, the second he started running, we started chasing him. But when we caught him, like, I was mopping the streets with him. And I just couldn't believe how not strong he was for what I perceived to be a man at the time. Hmm. And that was super inspiring. Like, oh, shit. And then we would disrupt this karate class in the uh, projects when we were kids. In the same way, if you're watching WWF wrestling, um... Somebody comes ringside and he's staring and then all of a sudden he jumps in and fucks the dude up or whatever. He, we would kind of disrupt the karate class the second the, the, the sensei left. We'd throw kids in headlocks. My man would start elbowing people. So the older dudes on the block knew we were disrupting the karate class and they kind of ambushed us one day. But we held our own against like these older dudes. And that was sort of inspiring. But, you know, 99% of the time I got into a fight it's because there was some big alpha dude in the neighborhood that needed to test me mm. for some reason. That's sort of what it is more often than not is some dude that just came home. It's a dude everyone's afraid of. And for some reason, my presence is making him uncomfortable today. Mm. I don't know what it is. Right. So but I, I got into a lot of fights. I've broken um, more fingers than I can think about. I mean, they're sideways and cracked and their teeth marks and knuckles and there's all sorts of calcium deposits here and the knuckles are slanted this one's enlarged and that's sideways mm -hmm. and that's you know all from fighting but it was sort of par for the course like new york was so dysfunctional that getting into a fight on a crowded street or on route somewhere just kind of happened you're at a club and some dude in the bathroom brushes you the wrong way and all of a sudden you're literally fighting in the stall in a restroom somewhere and shit and that's sort of how fights happened and um i don't regret it um, you know, it's, it's weird. Like, it's not something, unless you had asked me, we would have discussed today. Mm. But when I meet like men or alpha dudes or people that have read the art of getting over, or maybe they heard RD's interview here and they want to talk <laughs> about this, this fight, <laughs> this fight 30 years later. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like, dude, man, like I've done so many things since then that fight yeah, yeah. literally lasted six minutes out of my life. Mm. We've been cooler longer than we've had beef. 
And it's just one of those things where, like, it's not something I talk about. It's not something I'm proud of, but I acknowledge it. It was ever present. And, you know, I mean, I, someone ran up on me two years ago and I ended up, like, breaking my hand, uh, defending myself and shit, you know. Dude ended up getting 32 stitches. And I have the video on my phone. I, can show, I have a surveillance video on my phone I can show you. Yeah. I fought him with one hand. I had a knapsack in my hand, and I was holding my phone. Mm. So when he takes a swing, I just it, the surveillance tape has it. My homegirl lived in the condo there, and she gave me the tape. But dude takes a swing at me, and I move back. And because my hands fall, I tap him with a short elbow. Mm. He falls back and shit. And then the second he falls back, I just start hitting him. And then he grabs onto my leg, and I'm just cracking with my elbow because I'm still holding on my phone, mm. my knapsack, and I have headphones in my ear. It was over graffiti? No, nah, this was this dude's unhinged, and he okay, was just okay. a, a, like a kind of a bully. He owned a business in my neighborhood, mm. and he'd been like really like just, I don't know, man. He wasn't healthy, but he was like threatening women and dog walkers and people and trying to control a parking spot on the block. And, but, um, and sadly, yeah, I've got two videos of me fighting one that ricky powell shot outside of a nightclub mm. and then i've got some images of a fight outside of a show and then there's a story in the book which is probably way too much for one lifetime for someone that doesn't do this for a living but yeah, yeah um you know ideally as an adult i think there are a handful of things that are worth raising your hands for yeah um protecting your home your family your pockets and and then sometimes you know People just aren't always as respectful as they should be, and you know, yeah, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm super tolerant, but you know, like I'm, I grew up the way I grew up. And yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. certain like line that just shouldn't be crossed. I'll give you every opportunity not to cross it, but I think once we're there, that's where the problem happens. Yeah. So I've done a much better job of like, you know. Yeah, I feel like uh, like violence and beefs have become. Uh, from just what I hear and the people I'm around have become less prevalent within the graffiti community, which which I think is a good thing, um, to be honest. I know a lot of people want, like, the old way back. They want a dangerous city. They want this. They want that. But, um, yeah. But on, on, like, another note, you know, you've worked with uh, a number of companies. You've, you've put out a number of books. You've done a number of speeches. Uh, you were, a, you were a, like, one of the, my first memories ever of graffiti. Uh, I was in my house and I was just interested like I didn't know much about it and I was seeing it around the city and I was like yo let me like Google gra graffiti on YouTube or some shit and that's what I did and uh, I see the I think it was like Mark Echoes getting up and uh, I think the, pr the, the I think one of them the image is you yeah like the yeah, main yeah. image and yeah, I'm like it was weird and yeah. I was like yo I, I clicked it and I just start seeing this and I'm like oh my god this is crazy like this is the shit um you know it influenced me tr like i can't explain how much it influenced uh me my whole life uh and just the, you know how they say if if two boats are going this way and one goes this way just by two degrees and it has changed so much for me in my life it's introduced me to so many things from uh, music to just experiences and friends and there's people like you who essentially p paved the way for for all of this to happen you started writing at a point where nobody knew that any kind of opportunity whatsoever was going to be available within graffiti. What did, what do you think about all that now? Like with the ability to like, I went to Miami to Ket's uh, museum and he has a straight up, like very legit museum. Sure. Um, you know, they have the beyond the street show when, when it happened in New York was just straight up amazing. It was multiple floors, a real, a really impressive art exhibit, not something that you go there and you're like, uh, this is kind of boring. No, it was well thought out. It had writers from all over the world. It had its own little sections. Uh, and it's almost like not surprising. It's like these are fucking creative people who will do, who will get obsessed with what they do. So this isn't, it's not really surprising, but like, yeah, what, what do you think about that? Um, you know, had you asked me when I embarked on my creative journey like 28 years ago, if I thought that this would be this, like, hell no. And had you asked me who the guys that might have made it were that I was covering in the source, I would have not have had the guys that have, done well in the fine art world pegged as those guys that will translate to being important artist one day that was impossible to gauge but you know um it was an important window for me i wasn't an academic dude you know just to scale it back a hair i grew up um you know fascinated with graffiti and my education took a back seat to my fascination with bad things and graffiti and i 
by all accounts, stopped going to school in the seventh grade. I was pushed through junior high school because my um, principal didn't want to get stuck in school with me an extra year. We were in a very small junior high school. I'd been pushed around to three schools already, and they weren't going to move me again. So I kind of got pushed through, and by the time I arrived in the ninth grade, I was hanging out with guys that just rode on trains. But um, the source window was enormously important for me. You know, it put me in a professional setting and in a professional environment. I learned how to use a computer. I started laying out, you know, they encouraged me. They, they offered me a little bit of extra money to lay out my page digitally. So I started using Photoshop and Illustrator and Quark. And then um, it's like everything that I did in my real life or illegally had some real world application. Mm. Like um, I have a camera in my bag today. I typically carry a camera with me when I travel or whatever. In Learning how to document my work or the stuff that I like gave me an appreciation for photography, right? And composition and lighting and a rule of thirds and all of these important things that are critical to taking a good photo. And um, my ability to round up maybe 30 people to do something bad gave me an ability to work with large groups of people and navigate maybe difficult, a landscape of difficult personality types, hmm. right? So that we're all on the same page for the same goal and doing something dope today. And those, like, practices come in handy when you're curating a show like Beyond the Streets where you maybe have 150 featured artists. I can't imagine. Or you're, it's or you're so difficult. Or you're working on a book where you've got, you know, 100 contributors, 75, 50 contributors. You know, the Peace Book series alone, I think maybe there's a couple of hundred contributors between the, the three installments of the book. And I think that... Everything that I was doing, like being prolific and writing lots of graffiti, gave me a working knowledge of the culture. So I knew who was important and who was relevant, right? And really, like, what I didn't realize at the time was that you're sort of putting tools in your toolbox along your journey. And all of these, like, skills that you sort of fine-tune in real time become valuable assets in your real world, you know? And sometimes I tell people you're using powers for wrong. And if, you know, you can use a scale or you can have good customer relations, you can count cash, you can attract business, like, that's, like, you're in a good space. You're in a, a tremendous starting point. Hmm. And it's just a matter of being focused and figuring out what it is that you want to do. But, you know, my time at the source was enormously important. It was the first time in my life where I was in a professional setting. Like, what am I doing at an editorial meeting today? Like, how the fuck did this happen? In the fact that I had content in a magazine, but I started to notice a bunch of things immediately that were super rewarding. Like I would share art in the back of the source, and then the next coming months, all of the contributions are people in different countries trying to copy what they just saw in the magazine. And I'm like, this shit resonated with someone in Guam, and there's a kid in like New Zealand, and there's a guy in Africa trying to copy some shit that I just ran last month. And it's fascinating to me seeing like, all of these stamps from around the world come in, and then all of these jail letters coming into the source from like guys that I grew up looking up to that are all, all doing time. But um, it was an interesting evolution, and I think that having worked in print for so many years and trying to figure out what's cool or what's dope and shining a light on that, because there wasn't anything like that. Like, I had to sort of, you know, constantly butt heads with people because they wanted to cut my content from the magazine. They didn't see the value in it. And then they had an umbrella group do a survey and they s found out that it was the most popular section in the magazine between the 13 and 35 demographic. Mm. And it was the only area in the magazine that circulated sales outside of their target audience, you know, which was hip hop. So you had rave kids and skinheads and guys that went to hardcore or rave shit or something different that brought it because there was a Cess piece in the back, there was a Tracy 168 car, there was a scene piece, or there was some other, like maybe FX collaborative wall, but there were people buying it for different reasons. So it started to expand, but being able to, having to find something cool every month kind of put my finger on the pulse of what was cool, and it, you build this community of people that have supported what you do, and as you're evolving, they're evolving too, and some of these guys are doing really amazing things today. I think it's uh, such an amazing thing that, thing that you were able to take the shit that you learned in graffiti in the streets, growing up in Brooklyn, growing up in these rough areas, sneaking it, and you use it uh, with a broader brush or broader application to your everyday life. And I think that's something that um, anyone who's listening to this, not just a graffiti writer, but pretty much anybody, like 
what you learn in just your hobby that might from the outside world be considered useless uh, you're like you said you're 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 accumulating assets you're accumulating tools in your toolbox I think every person who lives has uh, leverage in one way or another maybe they just have not realized it that uh, something that they may they you always have like a point where you can start from that uh, you can use in, in a way that you w didn't think possible beforehand if you just open your mind to the broader spectrum of possibilities and uh, you know it's like I think about uh, like mass appeal or a life or um, what, what you did at the source and it's like you know th these are behemoth behemoth uh, like companies at, at one point that um, got there and involved graffiti graffiti writers people like who are fully like legit graffiti writers um, and they know what's good and they use that to just just broader brush it I don't know I think it's like the sickest thing it's very inspirational for me um, in terms of uh, New York and your life here have you ever thought of just moving out for good um I've considered it. I was, I've, I've entertained the whole notion of moving to Europe <laughs> and other places. But the truth is, I love the city I'm in. My mom is here, which is important mm. to me. Um, realize how blessed I am to still have her in my life. And um, I couldn't imagine not having her near. Mm. Um, and, uh, and the truth is that there are very few places in the world where I think I could do the amount of good things that I do here. You know, like, I'm perpetually doing something fun. I don't always share it on my social media. And then there's certain things that, you know, um, I don't even have my name attached to sometimes. Like, the truth is that I was content being a cog in this big machine producing really cool, meaningful content over the years. And not until we publish books that I actually have to stand up and raise my hand and take credit for anything that I did. And I was so anti-public speaking and didn't want to do it. What's the point? And my co-author, Sasha Jenkins, had really enlightened me and dropped a gem on me. And he's like, listen, man, you know, we just can't go sh places, shake hands and sign books. You know, he's like, people are fanatical about this content. They love it. And as fans, he's like, you're required to give them just a little bit more of your soul and yourself and just engage them in a conversation. And it was really difficult because Sasha is, you know, it's my brother, but he's a speech ninja. Like, he'll come in the room and body the crowd, and then he just drops the hot mic in my lap like, you're up next. And I'm like, fuck, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Mm. And it was super uncomfortable, but it was amazing because he pushed me outside of my comfort zone, right? And it's something really empowering about something that used to be terrifying and eventually just owning that space, you know? And I realized at, like, fucking 40-something years old that, like, shit, like... I could pay rent with a conversation this month and mm. I could lead a crowd and I can sit here and entertain folks. So, I've, you know, I've spoken at some really interesting places, but that was a skill set that was developed late in life. And, um, but it's another additional, I guess, sort of tool in the box or service that I can offer. And I think I've strayed a bit from the original question. Um, which was, I'm sorry. Uh, just about uh, just leaving New York, if you've ever thought of it. But yeah, I, I have considered it. I don't think I'd get the work that I could get outside of New York. And I'm not over New York yet. Yeah. Like, I'm still like a small child. Like, things are still exciting to me here. And, you know, the amount of work that I get to do here in the city. Like, in theory, I would have been on my fourth mural project this week had things not gotten scaled back. Right? And I don't know if I can get this work in another big city. Hmm. You know, but um, but I enjoy what I do here, and I've got a community of supporters and friends and family here, and I'm not over it yet. I entertain it all the time, but um, I don't know how serious I am about it. Yeah. Well, yo, it's uh, it's been a, over an hour. I, I want to say immense thank you for coming on the show. It's been a huge honor for me, and I, I feel like uh, there was a lot of value in this conversation. I, I gotta thank you for you know coming out here and sh sharing your story. Um. Just want to let you know that that like snapshot of a, in a 15 year old you to me was just fucking crazy. Like all the things, all the levers, all the the fire extinguisher plan, the the story of yard do with the beard. He came out of a car like I just got to say thank you, bro. It was it was a, it was an honor for me. Oh, it's all good, man. And I'm, I'm sorry it took this long to catch nah, up. Dude, man. It's all good, but bro. I'm, I'm glad that we were able to make it happen. man. Thank yeah. you for having me. 100%. Yo, thank you, man. Cool. Peace.